Hello? Welcome to thermal characterization as part of an empirical process for developing optimized formulations and lyophilization cycles presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Milrock Technology. My name is Mike Auerbach. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of American Pharmaceutical Review, and I'll be the moderator today. Before we begin, I'd like to let everyone know that this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentations. You can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box on your screen. Also, please note the resource box containing information and documents pertaining to this webinar. And now, let me introduce today's presenters. Tian Thompson is founder and president of Milrock Technology, a manufacturer of high-tech freeze dryers and related instrumentation for the biotech and pharmaceutical industries. Mr. Thompson has published num numerous articles and holds several patents with several other patents pending in the area of thermal control and freeze drying. Mr. Thompson received his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder and attended the Senior Executive Program on Global Strategic Development at Columbia University. Our other presenter, Dr. Jeff Schwegman, is the founder and chief executive officer of AB Biotechnologies, where he develops formulations, lyophilization cycles, determines residual moisture by Carl Fisher, and provides thermal characterization studies, including freeze-dry microscopy and DSC. He holds patents and develops new technologies within the lyophilization field. In November 2005, Dr. Schwegman formed Bioconvergence with three other founders which specialized in developing new formula formulations and manufacturing processes for parenteral products. In February 2008, he left Bioconvergence, which had become a successful company, to form AB Biotechnologies. He routinely lectures around the world on formulation, stabilization, and process development of lyophil lyophilized products. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Thompson and Dr. Schwegman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is T.N. Thompson speaking. Uh, good afternoon, evening, uh, or morning, depending on where you are today. I wanted to do a short introduction uh, prior to uh, Jeff speaking. Talk a little bit about the equipment side of the, of the technology. Um, it seems like the more we know about freeze drying, the less we really, re really know. And um, that's been true for the last 50 years. Uh, and so from an equipment perspective, we have to understand that all freeze dryers are not created equal. Uh, and it's very important to select the right product for the process. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have some issues with the actual uh, production of your product. Some of the features that you, you might want to look at uh, when choosing a freeze dryer uh, today are larger refrigeration systems, dual compressors, which have dramatically improved uh, the reliability of freeze dryers today. Um, You'll notice that today's freeze dryers are, have larger vapor pores that are also not very long in length, so you don't have a choke flow condition. Uh, many, of, many of the uh, freeze dryers that are in use today were designed 30 and 40 years ago and may have issues with choke flow uh, and other, other problems, uh, such as overloading of the condenser. Um, today's freeze dryers uh, should have sanitary clamps uh, on the chambers instead of just rubber hoses and tubing and, cl and uh, hose clamps. Uh, so that we can eliminate uh, vacuum issues. Uh, in the old days, we didn't even have vacuum control. Today, we have what we call advanced vacuum control, which is the use of a proportional vacuum uh, control that provides down to one millitor um, uh, stability in vacuum. But probably the biggest thing that's happened today in, in freeze drying is the uh, use of uh, personal computers and PLCs to control the process, collect data, and uh, give you the information that you need to produce the right product. There's also a, a new wave of process analytical technologies that are coming out. Uh, from Milrock, we have what we call LiOPAT, uh, which is a heat flux monitoring control system uh, that gives you all sorts of data during the freezing, primary drawing, and secondary and starting cycles. And it can also be used to control the process. Uh, there's a, there are several uh, controlled nucleation uh, Solutions out there, ours is called Freeze Booster, and it's available in a nucleation station that's actually portable. And then we have a, a new product out uh, called Lyosim, where we can actually use 19 vials to uh, develop protocols for, for much larger systems. So selecting the right freeze dryer is going to be critical. And if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, 
you can see that no two freeze dryers are really the same. In fact, uh, we rarely build two freeze dryers that are identical unless they're for the same customer. Uh, so it's important to understand that you, when you order a freeze dryer that you know what shelf area and shelf spacing you need, that you get the right shelf temperature, that it gives you the transition times that you need, that the condensing rate and capacity are proper, and it has the right materials of construction. Uh, you'll also want to uh, know if, it, if you need clean in place or SIP for your process. And bottom line is you'll have to talk to an expert uh, to help uh, guide you through that process and make sure you're getting the right product for your needs. So it's very important that we understand what freeze dryer we have, but it's also extremely important that we understand something about the product. So we can get the proper equipment, but if we don't understand what our product is, we don't have any product knowledge, then we're not going to produce the, the best product in the least amount of time. So it's uh, my pleasure at this point to, under, to, to introduce Dr. Dr. Jeff Schwegman, uh, and he'll discuss uh, all the important aspects of understanding your product and the critical parameters that are necessary to develop uh, the proper protocols. Jeff, uh, over to you. Okay, Tian, thank you very much. And uh, like uh, Tian mentioned, Mike, uh, welcome everyone. Um, we're glad to have you uh, part of our webinar today. Um, so Tian covered some of the instrument issues in um, uh, regards to LIO cycles. Um, and I'm going to cover more of the science of that. Um, so my entire career has been in, in contract development. And I've seen just a little bit of everything um, that people have uh, wanted to try to freeze dry. I mean, pharmaceutical products, um, you know, injectable drugs, tissues, foods, um, all, you know, you name it, anything under the sun that, that could potentially be freeze dried, um, you know, we've probably at least investigated it uh, with one client or another. Now, when I got my start in the industry, um, freeze drying, and this tells you how my age, um, freeze drying was still more of a, uh, an art than a science. Or, and and the, the, the way we approached it was the, the freeze dryer was the black box of the manufacturing uh, procedure. So we take our product, put it in the freeze dryer, push the button, and hope that in you know a week or two we got something that at least looked decent and had somewhat you know good stability. Well, a lot of that's changed, so we're starting to understand a lot more about the science behind freeze drying. And this becomes important not only like some of the things that TN mentioned with, with engineering of the freeze dryers to make them, them function better and more efficiently, but also um, you know, how long our products are staying in the freeze dryer. Um, freeze dryers are expensive equipment-wise, but also maintaining them, operating them, it, it, it's very expensive. So it makes a lot of sense to only freeze dry your product as long as you have to. Um, and, and we've had a lot of work that we've done with the contract manufacturing companies. They, they want to get products in and out of their freeze dryers as fast as possible. They don't make money with product sitting in their freeze dryer. They make you know, more money by running more products through the freeze dryer. So what we're going to focus on today is sort of understanding what we call the thermal properties behind our formulation. Each formulation is going to be different for the most part. And how we approach cycle design is really based on the thermal properties of the formulation. Um, again, with the understanding that there are certain things we can put in a formulation that are going to make it very difficult to freeze dry, and it's going to be a very long cycle, if we can even freeze dry it at all. So some of the tools that I, I have in my bag of excipients, if you will, you know, there are things I would, I would put in a liquid formulation that I would never even consider putting in a freeze-dried formulation just simply for the fact that how it's going to affect how that product freeze-dries. Okay, so the goal of LIO development, and this is somewhat intuitive, um, we want to design the fastest, most robust cycle that consumes the least amount of energy and still meet our, our product quality. And again, this just goes back to what I was saying. With We want to freeze-dry as fast as we can, but still we have to make sure that the quality of our product, you know, still meets specification and it's consistent. So batch to batch to batch, everything's consistent. We're getting good quality product um, that meets all of our specifications that can be released to then to the market. Now, choosing the dryer parameters, and this is again where we're going to really focus in on thermal characterization to to identify the thermal properties of our formulation. They need to be based on sound physical characterization of the formulation and really understanding how these characteristics impact the final product. 
Now, uh, the FDA is really getting more educated on this and taking an active role in understanding you know, thermal characterization and, and freeze drying. Um, I know they, they have several freeze dryers that they have purchased uh, that they keep on site that they can work with. And I do know that if you're filing um, a new drug application and you've got it's a freeze dried product, you can be sure they're going to be asking you about collapse temperatures and eutectic melting temperatures, last transition temperatures, and how the cycle was developed around those. So it's something you, you really need to be sure and, and understand in advance um, because you don't want to leave that out because they will ask you about that for your product when you're trying to get approval to go to market. Okay, now I like this slide because this really drives home the need for um, you know optimizing a freeze drying cycle. Now um, we won't go into a lot of detail here on this, but the driving force of freeze drying or sublimation of ice during primary drying is a change in pressure. So we get a very high pressure at the sublimation front, which is where we're converting the ice directly from a solid to a vapor, and then it goes to the condenser. That's a relatively high pressure environment. Now at the surface of the condenser where our water is collecting, our water vapor collects, it needs to be a very low pressure environment. Um, and we keep that very cold, so anything that gets near, any water vapor that get, gets near that condenser immediately crystallizes and sticks to the condenser. So that's a very low pressure environment, high pressure environment at the sublimation front, and we need that wide delta P. That's the driving force of freeze drying. But what I'm going to show you here, according to this graph, is that how quickly we can convert that ice to, to a vapor or the sublimation rate, what we call the vapor pressure of the ice, is dependent on temperature, and it's not a direct relationship. Um, so what you can see here, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a, a pointer I can use, but you'll notice that as we, we decrease in temperature, the vapor pressure, or think of how quickly something is going to dry, decreases exponentially. So, you know, when a client comes to us and, and wants us to develop a cycle and said, well, let's just, you know, just to be safe, let's keep the product temperature at negative 45 during primary drying, well, you know, it's going to take forever to freeze dry that because it slows down how quickly that ice can convert to vapor and dry. And so this is why it becomes extremely important to identify the critical, what we call the critical temperature. Okay, so, you know, if, if we could freeze dry, say, at negative 20 versus negative 45, you know, we're shaving the cycle down from, you know, perhaps maybe two weeks down to two or three days. And that, that's not an unrealistic um, expectation. The warmer you can take your product, um, the faster it's going to freeze dry exponentially. Now, the flip side of that is you don't want to exceed that critical temperature, because then we run the risk of getting into issues that uh, collapse, eutectic melting. So there's a, there's, a, there's a very tight window of where we need to be in regards to temperature. We don't want to dry extremely low, because it's going to take forever, but we don't want to dry too warm, because then we run the risk of collapsing or damaging the product. So where is that sweet spot that we want to be in primary drying, uh, really maximize that sublimation rate? And that's the, the techniques we're going to use to do that and explain some of the science behind what we're looking for um, is, is sort of the, the, the main topic of this webinar. Okay, so let's, let's cover a few definitions here. So let's talk about um, two of the typical forms we're going to see in our products. Now, this is after we've frozen the product down, um, and we'll, we'll get into more of what's going on during freezing. But generally what we're going to be dealing with are one of two um, different solids that are forming in our product. Um, Number one would be the eutectic. Now, when I say eutectic, I want you to think crystalline. So when these, these molecules solidify, the, the sample solidifies during freezing, the molecules in the formulation will line up in a very precise pattern called a crystalline lattice. Okay? Now, when we say a eutectic, it's, it's an intimate mixture of two or more crystalline. Again, crystalline is the key, but it's more than one crystalline species that will form, um, form the solid phase, form the eutectic. Now, um, what we're dealing with, uh, one of the crystalline species might be, say, a crystalline excipient or a crystalline active ingredient. The other crystalline species is going to be ice. So there's a little bit of ice that forms crystals. Ice, ice does crystallize. Um, and there's a little bit of ice that will crystallize with our excipient or our active that will form that eutectic. Now, the key here is that the combination is so intimate, they're so close together, they, they melt like a single pure substance. Okay. 
let's contrast that with a glassy or amorphous phase. Now, in this particular case, the molecules, when they form a solid, the molecules don't line up in, in a precise pattern. In fact, it's just a complete disarray of the molecules when they solidify. And that's what we call an amorphous phase or a glassy phase. Um, and what we, so when we talk about a eutectic going through its eutectic melt, we say, you know, eutectic melting temperature. We talk about a glassy phase going through its glass transition temperature or Tg prime. Now, this is another good slide. So let's kind of think about what's going on when our product is, is forming a solid or freezing. Now, again, freezing is done at atmospheric pressure. Um, so we started the solution phase at the top. Now, what I don't have on the slide is as we go down, we're actually decreasing in temperature. So we start to decrease in temperature, and then we hit a temperature of our solution, and it's going to be somewhere you know, well below zero for the most part, something due to what we call freezing point depression and supercooling. Our sample's going to finally freeze. Now, what we see here, well, I, I take that back. There's one of two different things that can happen. We can actually sometimes get solute uh, crystals, whether that's excipients or active ingredients, exceeding the solubility limit and falling out. We don't like that. What we really want is the next phase down, which we see as ice nucleation. So we get so cold, water molecules are spinning together, trying to come together and form a, nucle a stable nucleus and then fly apart. Well, finally, we hit a temperature, and there's other factors as well that can aid in nucleation, where we get a stable nucleus. Now, this is one water molecule coming together with another and forming a stable nucleus. Once that happens, it sort of opens the floodgate, and we start to get massive crystallization. Um, now, this is only ice, okay, or only water coming together to form ice. And this is where we get a phase separation in our sample. So we start, you know, form a stable nucleus of water, forms a little crystal of ice, and then ice crystals begin to grow. Now, as they do that, everything else in our formulation, including the active ingredient, the excipients, surfactants, you name it, everything else in our formulation is pushed around those ice crystals into what we call the interstitial space. Um, so it's still a fluid in the interstitial space, okay? So even though it looks like it's frozen, that interstitial space containing everything else in our formulation is, sterile, is still a fluid. Now, after ice nucleation, you'll notice as we go down, again, I mentioned ice crystal growth. Now, the ice crystals in the ice channels are growing by pulling water out of the interstitial space. So what we find is that interstitial space gets smaller and it gets more concentrated. So this can be a damaging environment for some, some molecules, specifically if you're talking about your proteins, you know, your monoclonal antibodies, enzymes, because it became, becomes super concentrated. So if there's any salts in your formulation, the, the tonicity of that, that interstitial space is going to go through the roof. So, again, this is why I tell clients that come to us, you know, minimize the salt in your formulation. You do run the risk of damaging your product. Okay, then finally we hit a temperature and a concentration where one of four different things is going to happen. Um, if our sample is going to form a crystal and crystallize, that's where we see on the left here it forms that eutectic. So there is a little bit of water left in the interstitial space, and then the excipient or the active will then combine with that water to form that eutectic. Um, on the other side here, we see stable glass. So if the molecules aren't going to crystallize, basically it gets thicker and thicker and colder and colder, and then it just gets so thick it can't crystallize, or I'm sorry, it, it forms a solid. Now, that's the big difference here. So when we form the eutectic, molecules come together, form bonds, ta-da, we got a solid. For the glassy phase, or the amorphous phase, it's just a simple shift in viscosity. So it gets thicker and colder and thicker, and all of a sudden it gets so thick it can't move any for and forms a solid. Okay? Now let's contrast that down here with what we call the metastable glass. Um, so this is a species that, and when I say metastable, I technically mean unstable. It, it, it will go to its lowest energy form, probably after you've manufactured it and it's sitting on the shelf, and then it's going to wreak havoc on your formulation. So basically, the metastable glass, it, it's a glassy phase, but it should have formed a eutectic. The eutectic is its more stable, lowest energy form. Um, but for a number of reasons that are a little bit outside the scope of this webinar, um, it, it, it was not allowed to actually form the eutectic, so it's locked. As a, as a glassy phase or a metastable glassy phase. Now, for those of you who have experience with freeze drying, um, this would be where we'd say, let's add an annealing step or a thermal treatment step to get rid of that. Um, and again, a little bit out of the 
uh, scope of this webinar. I do say a little bit more about it in a, in, in a slide or two, but um, yeah, so when, I, when we have samples come into our lab, when clients send samples into our lab for thermal characterization, we see the three of these, you know, probably on an equal basis. And generally, if we, you know, the formulations we're, we're developing today are extremely complex to support the, the molecules that were, you know, the molecules of interest. So we may have, you know, glassy phases, amorphous phases, or I'm sorry, glassy phases, crystalline eutectic phases, metastable, all in one formulation. So again, understanding what's in your formulation, identifying the critical temperature, do we need to anneal, you know, it all comes down to understanding that before we even go near a freeze dryer, because it's just going to be a nightmare trying to develop a stable formulation and a stable, you know, lyophilization cycle to give you a good product over time. Lyotropic liquid crystals here on the far right, I've seen one of those in my career, so we're really not going to focus on that um, as part of this webinar. Okay, so the important temperatures. Again, we talked about the eutectic melting temperature. Um, below the eutectic melting temperature, it's a solid, and this becomes important. Same thing with the glass transition temperature here, TG prime. Below the eutectic melting temperature, below the glass transition temperature, that interstitial space is a solid. Above those critical temperatures, it's a fluid. Now, this becomes extremely important because in primary drying, the goal of primary drying is to remove the ice in the ice channels. Okay. Now, ice acts as scaffolding in the frozen product. So, say for example, I mean, so we freeze the product, ice is solid in the ice channels, but we're slightly above our glass transition temperature. So the ice is solid, it looks frozen, but in the interstitial space, it is still a fluid. You can't see this with a naked eye. It looks frozen. However, what we find is if we start primary drying and we start pulling the ice out of the ice channels and that interstitial space is, is, is not a solid, this is where we get collapse. And this is where you, and I've got an image of a vial here, I'll show you in a couple slides, but this is where you open up your, your freeze dryer and all your vials are full of a little puddle of goo. We don't want that. So again, it's very important to be below these critical temperatures. Um, the collapse temperature down at the bottom, this is very close to what we would call as the TG prime, the glass transition temperature, but it's a little bit different. The first two points here, we would measure with uh, a differential scanning calorimetry. The collapse, we, we use a freeze dry microscope to do that. And we'll talk as we go along about um, what each of those pieces of equipment offer to um, the complete thermal package, if you will, for our sample. Okay, and, and eutectics and glasses, these freeze dry very differently. So it's in, absolutely important to understand, again, not only what form we have. Is it, is it a crystalline eutectic? Is it a glass amorphous? Is it a mixed system? Is it a metastable system? Absolutely critical before we even go near a freeze dryer. Okay, so as I mentioned before, in primary drying, again, we're pulling the ice out of the ice channels. It's extremely important to be below the TG prime glass transition temperature or the TE, the eutectic melting temperature, or we're not going to get a solid product in the vial. It's going to be a puddle of, puddle of goo in the bottom of the vial. Okay, and this just, again, shows you this is, this is what you don't want to see. Um, manufacturing, production, management gets very upset with development scientists when they recommend a cycle and they open the door and this is what you get. Now, it doesn't look pretty, obviously. You can imagine the reconstitution is going to be terrible because um, one of the benefits we get when we freeze dry and get a very nice cake is that that cake is very porous because where all the ice crystals used to be, now they're hollow, empty spaces. So when we rehydrate, and add our reconstitution fluid, it runs into those spaces and really quickly hydrates. So we, we've essentially closed those down. There are no uh, open pores in a collapsed product. Additionally, this is going to trap moisture a lot more um, than, a, than a nicely freeze-dried product. So, you know, we're in a good cake, we might be getting down to less than 1% in something like this. Who knows? I mean, you could be 10, 20% moisture because it's just very difficult to get out. Reconstitution could be terrible. Again, this thing is its what we call now a vacuum-dried glass in, in, in contrast to a, a nice freeze-dried cake. So it may take you 30 minutes to shake and reconstitute this. So this is something we want to definitely avoid during freeze-drying. And again, just showing you the difference here between the eutectics and glasses. Again, the um, 
little channels. You can see the ice channels in between those channels. We see the interstitial space. Now in a eutectic, again, it's tiny little crystals of ice and tiny little crystals of active or excipient. The glassy phase, again, we still have the ice channels, but now we've got this really rigid, solid mass. And these trap water very differently. Um, so, you know, how we approach primary and or secondary drying is, is going to be dependent on, you know, identifying what we have. Okay, unfrozen water, and again, this is something that we, we definitely see in freeze-dried products. Now, you ask, how can we have unfrozen water if we're taking a product down to negative 45? Well, it exists in the interstitial space. So all the ice in the ice channels, yes, it will be frozen, crystal, and solid. However, you know, with the amorphous solid, if we've got a glassy phase, it has water embedded inside it. Um, it acts as what we call a plasticizer, but it's not, it's not crystalline water. It's unfrozen water. Okay. And we can sometimes trap, you know, 10 to 50 percent of all the water in the formulation could actually be stuck inside this, this amorphous phase. Now, we've got to get it out, and it's, it's during secondary drying that we drive that out. Um, but it is unfrozen water. And, again, how we approach our secondary drying is absolutely critical on understanding what we have. For crystalline solutes, we may, you know, have some unfrozen water, but it's just going to be one or two molecules loosely associated with the surface of the crystals. So, again, you know, it, it's at the end of primary drying, if you've got a completely crystalline formulation, it's already going to be 99.99% dry. I mean, I've developed cycles where we have not even used a secondary drying protocol cause, because primary drying was enough to get it dry, you know, meet our spec. That's not going to be the case with an amorphous, uh, amorphous uh, formulation. Okay, we talked about that. So in, in secondary drying in, a, in, a, in an amorphous phase, water has got to diffuse to the surface of the glass before it can vaporize. So this is a, can be a very slow process. You know, um, and if you go too quickly, you can actually collapse your product on your ramp up to secondary drying. Well, that's not the case with a crystalline formulation. I mean, you can be very aggressive. And again, in some cases, I said, you know, we've been able to do primary drying and skip secondary drying altogether with a crystalline phase. Okay, so the, crit the critical temperatures in freeze drying, again, the glass transition temperature, the eutectic melting temperature, for the most part, represent the warmest temperature we can go during primary drying without collapsing the product. Um, so again, this is something that we have to be, you know, pay very close attention to, um, to make sure that we're drying um, Efficiently, again, we're not going to be 20, 30 degrees C below this temperature because we know, we know it's going to really slow down that process. But again, we don't want to be, you know, right there at that critical temperature because then we run the risk of collapsing or eutectic, you know, eutectic melting the product. Okay, so how do we do it? Now, there's there's several different ways we could do it. Now, the, the first four bullet points here are what we would classically call thermal analysis. And then, so one, any, any one of these could work. Now, some are obviously better than others, and we'll, we'll talk about, we've, we've already mentioned DSC. It is the gold standard of um, what we used for um, thermal analysis, either standard DSC or modulated DSC. Um, I won't say anything about these other techniques just in the limitations of time that we're gonna have, but these have been used in the past, again, with, with uh, decent results, but again, if, you, if you're going to be doing this and you want meaningful information, the DSC is going to be the, uh, the technique of choice. Um, we always back that up with freeze dry microscopy. Again, these two techniques give slightly different supportive information that really gives us the complete thermal picture of our sample, so we know exactly how it's going to behave as a function of temperature during, during freeze drying. Okay, so thermal analysis. Let's talk a little bit about this and, and how DSC is going to work. So for those of you who took physical chemistry in college, um, you might recall that uh, anytime we have a physical or chemical change that's occurring in a material, as we change the temperature of that material, it's going to give off or absorb a little bit of heat, okay? Um, what we call um, exothermic or an endothermic reaction. And, and that's what the DSC is picking up. Um, again, the most common technique that we use, and, and again, the gold standard of what we're doing today in thermal 
thermal characterization would be the DSC. Now, the differential thermal analysis system, this is something that's um, older technology. Um, it is does give you some limited information, but again, the DSC is what we what we use in our lab and what um, most companies are using if they're doing thermal characterization. Okay, so basically in DSC, um, uh, we're taking our sample. Now, this is the sample. It's going to be in its liquid state. Um, and again, it should re be representative of the formulation, meaning it um, you should take that and it would be the same exact formulation sample that you would put in a vial and add to your freeze dryer. So what's uh, we've also got there, so there's two uh, thermal uh, benches or uh, ovens, essentially, if you will, or furnaces. Um, the sample goes on one, uh, an empty reference pan goes on the uh, on the other and we'll talk about what's going on with heat transfer of that so basically um, what the DSC is measuring is, is heat flow it's not measuring a change in temperature between the sample and the reference so as we increase in temperature we're monitoring the heat flow now the way the DSC works is that the the instrument wants to keep the sample chamber uh, the sample and the reference pan at the same temperature so as we freeze down and we warm up, we know the sample is going to go through different transitions, whether it's crystallizing or melting and it's it's giving off or absorbing heat. Well, the DSC senses that and says, well, we're going to pull a little bit of energy away from that to keep the sample pan and the reference pan at the same temperature. So it's it's the amount of heat or the heat flow um, that's supplied to the sample, um, the amount of heat over time that's supplied to the sample to keep it at the same temperature as the reference pan. Now, what this allows us to do is to start to extract some thermodynamic variables um, out of our sample. Um, so, again, the heat flow we know is what the instrument is supplying to the sample. The heating rate is what we control, so we tell the instrument how fast to warm or cool the product. Um, dividing the heat flow by the heating rate, we get what's known as the heat capacity. This is something that's very relative uh, to anybody doing any any thermal work. Um, regardless of the industry, I mean, you look at people doing um, plastics and, and all that. I mean, a lot of this, uh, I mean, we're only scratching the surface of what the DSC can do. Um, by integrating the heat capacity as a function of the temperature, we can now extract the enthalpy or the amount of energy that was involved in that transition. Um, we can get the entropy of that, that reaction. So, again, a lot of this stuff we're not doing for thermal characterization, but Again, if you're publishing papers or at the university, this is something that becomes extremely important. Okay, so this is a stip the, the DSC in our lab. It's a TA Instruments DSC, one of the leading uh, manufacturers of, of this type of equipment, the thermal equipment. Um, so basically, um, this is our little sample well here. You see it's very tiny. So we typically will use uh, 15 to 20 microliters of product that we put in our sample well, so it doesn't consume a lot. We also do something called uh, hermetically seal it. So we've got a crimper that seals that pan against the environment. And the reason we do that is to prevent evaporation of the sample as it's uh, sitting out and or being tested. Now, when using DSC for conducting thermal characterization, we generate two curves. We generate a heating curve and a cooling curve. So we start the sample analysis at room temperature. We cool down. Now, in our lab, we've got a refrigerated cooling system, um, a compressor cooled system that will go down to negative 90. And we always go down to negative 90. Now, is it applicable to what you could do in a freeze dryer? No. But what we found is that sometimes we get samples from people that have put things in there that are just horrendous. So we don't even get the sample frozen until negative 50 or 60. Um, so we don't want to miss anything. So, uh, you know, through experience, bad experience, we've learned to just go down as low as we can go, and then we warm up from negative 90 to, to room temperature just because we don't want to m miss anything. You know, being a contract development lab, we see all kinds of stuff under the sun, so now we generally go down to negative 90. So there's two, two types of curves here um, that we'll take a look at. So you'll notice the, the bottom curve, um, it's cooling in temperature. We see this big, sharp spike. That's the that's the ice freezing in the sample. Okay. Now you'll notice it doesn't occur. It's a little tough to see in my window, but until about negative 17, negative 18. Now we get down to negative 90 at the far end. We warm up. We see this big melt here. And these are the same thermal events. And notice the difference in temperature. 
Um, again, with, with freezing, we see freezing point depression. We see um, supercooling. So it essentially becomes meaningless information in regards to thermal characterization. Um, the only reason we look at this is to see where the sample is finally freezing. You know, negative 20, negative 18, very typical. It's what we're looking for is if samples don't freeze it until negative 45 or lower, then you got a real problem. You can't even get the sample frozen. If you can't freeze the sample, you can't freeze dry the sample. That's what I'm getting at. So we essentially throw away the cooling curve and then look at the warming curve for our thermal events. Now, what we've got here are examples of um, warming curve, so we've cut the cooling curve off. Now, this is extremely important and provides a wealth of information. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here at um, the first one here, the one at the bottom is the eutectic melt. Um, very characteristic, sharp, symmetric peak, um, very classic example of a eutectic melt. Anytime we see this, a peak like this, crystalline eutectic every time. Now, the software of our DSC um, calculates what we call the onset of the melt. So the leading baseline, the, the software will draw a tangent, and then the front edge of that peak, it will draw a tangent, and where they intersect somewhere below is what we call the onset of the melt. Now let's look up here at the glass transition in the middle. You'll notice this is a completely different shaped curve. Um, so it's what we call an S-curve. Well, the software draws a tangent to the leading baseline, a tangent to the trailing baseline, and the midpoint of that uh, of those uh, 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 lines is what we call the PG prime of the glass transition. So again, just simply the shape of the peak tells us what it is, and then the software calculate the TG prime or the eutectic melt. Now, on top, what we see is a, ca a classic example of a metastable glass. Um, so what we'll see as we're warming up, we see a glass transition followed by a little peak which is what's called enthalpy recovery, and then we see this big drop. That's, that's crystallization. So that tells me that metastable glass we formed um, is, is now crystallizing when we warm it. So this would, again, tell us we need to anneal our sample. Um, we talked about this in DSC, again, how the baseline shifts up or down. Again, if it's an exotherm or an endotherm, those re you know, represent different melting or crystallizing, uh, freezing or crystallization events. Um, now, what if we can't detect our low temperature glass transition? Well, we can increase or change the heating rate. Now, what we see here um, in this graph, when we first ran the graph, you'll see the inset here. Just kind of cover that up or, or don't consider that. If, if we run the graph and we just see this one peak, and we say, well, if we take that um, you know, as, as fact and say, well, it looks here like we can um, you know, freeze dry about negative 10 below this thermal event, we're going to be safe, but that's not true. If we look back in the baseline, you'll notice there's this low temperature glass transition that's completely going to screw everything up with our formulation. So again, glass transitions are very low energy events. If you don't look for it, you won't find it. Okay, so if we want to increase the heating rate, we increase the sensitivity. So if you know you've got a glassy phase in there, you're not seeing um, the, the transitions, you know, you can increase the heating rate to increase the sensitivity of that instrument. Um, I'm not going to read through this. Um, it's just kind of the technique that we use for measuring um, the glass transition temperature of liquids. Now, we can also do this in solids. So even after we freeze dry the product, it still has a collapse temperature which is a function of moisture and temperature. So these two techniques, again, you can refer back to these um, later if you're doing this type of work, but it just talks about how we run the instrument and, and analyze the data if we're looking for a TG prime in the frozen state or a TG in, in the dried state. Okay, let's talk about freeze-dry microscopy here, and um, then we'll get to some client examples that um, are going to really kind of drive home um, you know, how thermal analysis, thermal properties affect uh, what we do in every, uh, you know, in everyday life and developing uh, lyophilization cycles. So the freeze-dry microscopes allows us to take a direct examination of freezing and freeze-drying by a special microscope and thermal stage. Now, this complements the data we get from the DSC, so we would never run just the DSC or just the microscope, because then we're kind of missing a, some information of the complete thermal properties of our formulation. This is the instrument in our lab um, provided by Macron Microscopes out of Chicago. They're the only distributor in the United States. Um, 
the components, I mean, on the right here, we see the controllers. It, it, can, it cools the system with liquid, with liquid nitrogen. Um, so this is a pump temperature controller. Um, we also have vacuum control, which it's kind of difficult for me to see, but um, but there's a back there's a vacuum pump in the background. Um, I'll kind of show you a breakdown of a little tiny freeze dryer stage that goes on the instrument. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of the equipment in detail with this. Um, what I don't recommend is trying to build one of these instruments uh, on your own. Um, again, as I mentioned, Macron Microscopes. Um, is the distributor in the United States, and they will put the package together for you. So as soon as it comes out, as soon as it comes out of the box, it's going to work. They'll come on site and train you um, on the operation of the instruments. But again, it, the devil's in the details in this instrument. If you don't get all the tiny little details that make this system work right, you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be happy with the instrument. So this is sort of the mini freeze dryer that sits on the on the microscope stage. Um, on the side here, there's lines, vacuum lines. On the back, we see the um, lines where the um, liquid nitrogen comes in. Um, there's a plug on the back for electric electrical connection that allows us to warm the stage. So basically, this top, we just unscrew the top, and then we kind of get to the guts of the instrument. Uh, on the left, you see the little thermal silver block. Um, the white line leading into it is... Um, uh, thermocouple so we can monitor the temperature of the block. Um, so on the on the right at the bottom you see we've pulled the sort of the guts out of the thing. Um, on top it's what they call the lollipop and this thing is absolutely invaluable. This thing allows us to move the sample while it's freeze drying. Now what you'll notice on the image in the left in the center of that silver block there's a tiny little hole one millimeter in diameter. That is our field of view. That's where the light comes through. So if our sublimation front passes that field of view, we're essentially blind unless we can move the sample. So Lincoln was, uh, has been very innovative in developing you know, what we call the lollipop here that allows us to move the sample around um, while it's freeze drying so we can sort of follow that sublimation front. So in addition to determining the critical temperatures, it's possible um, with the freeze dryer microscope to tell if our system is crystalline or at least partially crystalline. So the, the microscope that we use is, does have polarized light. And again, it allows us to determine uh, crystalline or partially crystalline systems in our formulation. Now, I'm not going to go too much into polarized light microscopy theory, um, but I do want to show you this. So on the far right, um, you do notice the molecules, what we call amorphous. So the molecules are in all complete disarray. We don't show, see these showing up as color under the microscope. Now, there is color under the microscope, and it's actually a magenta color that we notice, but that's due to a special filter that we put in place. Um, but other than the magenta, if we have a completely amorphous system, we're not going to see any color other than the magenta. Now, what you'll notice on the far left with the sodium chloride is what we call an isotropic crystal, meaning, um, say, for example, with sodium chloride, it doesn't matter if we could actually hold this crystal in our hand, it doesn't matter how we tilted it, it would always be sodium chloride, sodium chloride, sodium chloride. Now let's contrast that with the calcite here, which is what we call an anisotropic crystal. So it has what we call crystallographically distinct axis, um, axes, meaning if I could pick up that crystal and look at one end, I'd see one end of the molecule. If I turn that crystal over, I'd see the other end of the molecule, so they're distinct. The ends of the crystal or the sides of the crystal are distinct. These are the ones that show up as, as varying colors under the microscope. And again, it's what we call anisotropic crystals, which, again, crystal, crystallographically distinct axis. So depending on how we have that crystal turned or depending on our field of view to the crystal under the microscope, we're going to see variability uh, in the color. Okay, again, as before, I'm not going to read through the technique here. This is something, again, that... Um, you can read through uh, on your own time if you've got a system, but again, this is something that we use in our lab. You know, the, the devil's in the details of the technique. You want to make sure you do it right. And again, if this is something that um, you're interested in buying an instrument from a Chrome, they would obviously come train you in the proper technique. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of imagers that we might see under the microscope. Now, the image on the left here, the squiggly lines are ice, ice channels. Now, I have to admit, we have manipulated the, the, the sample temperature-wise to maximize this. You would really not see this in, in the real world. 
with normal freezing. But we did this on purpose to show you the difference between the interstitial space, which you see in between the squiggly lines, and the ice and the ice channels. Now, what, it's difficult to see, but there's a little bit of color associated with that interstitial space. And that's due to the birefringence of those anisotropic crystals. Now, what you'll notice is we are below the eutectic melting temperature on the slide on the left because I can just see it's a solid. Now, if we warm up, which is the image on the right, above the eutectic melting temperature, that interstitial space fluidizes. We've exceeded the eutectic melting temperature, but notice we have not exceeded the ice melt. So there's still ice in the ice channel, so this thing would still have solid structure, but if we tried to freeze-dry the one on the right, we'd just get a, a you know, total eutectic melt, puddle of goo in the bottom of the vial. Okay, so let's take a look at an amorphous phase. So now in our lab, when a sample comes in for thermal characterization from a client, um, we freeze it and collect an image. Now you'll notice in this image we see variability in the color. And again, so this tells me I've got some anisotropic crystals that are giving, you know, that are birefringent in, in my formulation. So then we start freeze drying the sample, collect an image in the frozen state, then we start freeze drying. Now we freeze dry at a temperature well below our glass transition or eutectic melting temperature that we've determined in the DSC. I want to get an image of an intact dried layer. So what we see on the right is the dried layer, the left is the frozen layer, and that line in between the two, that razor-thin line, is what we call the sublimation front. That's where we're actively converting ice crystals to um, uh, vapor. And then we just keep warming the sample and warming the sample until we see that sample go through its collapsing event. And we're taking images all along that process as we warm. So we say, okay, at this temperature, we started to see a little bit of collapse. As we kept getting warmer, 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 we see the, 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 the sample totally collapse. So what's going on in here is we've exceeded the TG prime. The interstitial space fluidizes. When we pull the ice out, it can't support its own weight, and we get collapse. Okay, so uh, basically what, what I'm going to walk you through now in the last couple of minutes are um, some of the client products that we've had come into our lab. Um, the first company was a diagnostic company. No offense to the diagnostic people, but they tend to have the worst formulations that we see. Um, so we did the thermal characterization. Their problem was they were showing total collapse in their product um, and terrible stability. So we went through and did some, did some analysis. Um, what we found is that their product had an extremely low glass transition temperature um, to the point um, where we uh, couldn't even freeze dry it. Okay? In this particular case, the glass transition temperature, we didn't even observe it. So we couldn't even get low enough. In this sample, we only went down to negative 65. We couldn't get low enough. So what we ended up doing, uh, again, this is the freeze dry microscopy. I don't uh, okay, this is just freeze drying at negative 45. Again, we can't we can't retain image, so we know the glass transition temperature is somewhere below negative 65. We didn't even see it in the DSC. Um, now, one of the tools that we have in our toolkit is what we call glass transition temperature modifiers. So we can actually blend in amorphous phases with higher glass transition temperatures and and sort of raise the overall glass transition temperature of our formulation to the point where we can actually freeze dry it in, um, in you know, a decent amount of time. What we generally reach for most is Dextran 40, or sometimes we'll even use gelatin. These are both very well suited to raise glass transition temperatures to get them into a, a manageable temperature that we can actually freeze dry them. So for this uh, first run here under the DSC, we blend it in. 22 mg per mil of the dextran, and we noticed we went from a, a glass transition of where we couldn't even see it up to about negative 38. So we're not there yet, but we're definitely seeing an improvement. Okay, we blended in a little more, and in this particular case, we got it up to 40 mg per mil. Now we're up to negative 29. So again, we're having an improvement here by blending in increasing amounts of that dextran. Okay, by adding 60 we're now up to negative 20, almost 25. And that's, that's perfect. Freeze drying at something at negative 25 is well within the limits of what we could consider acceptable. We even took it one step further and took it up to negative, or I'm sorry, 80 mg per mil and got it up to about negative 22. Now this is great. Now, the problem with this particular sample was that the more dextran we add, and I'll show a su summary slide here, um, the more dextran we add, it tends to get gummy upon reconstitution. So in this particular case, um, 
I think we ended up going with 60 mix per mil of the dextran. But you just see again here the benefit of doing the thermal characterization, running the DSC, okay, we can't even freeze dry this, and then doing formulation optimization studies to optimize that, that critical temperature. Okay, um, it's another product that makes beautiful cakes. It dries very quickly. The accelerated stability is good. Long-term stability, they're currently looking at uh, as we speak. Okay, for the next product. Um, this was an injectable drug pro uh, company. Um, the small-scale batches showed good freeze drying. Again, when they were doing this in the development dryer, however, they scale it up and everything uh, fails, starts to collapse. Now, why is this happening? Well, we went through, and the first thing we do, again, the DSC comes into our lab. Now, this particular case, it was running about uh, right around negative 34. Um, so what we ended up doing was this product um, drying very slowly. Okay, so we, we said, is there any way we can improve that? Um, in this particular case, too, we had, I can't remember if this it was this client or not. Um, okay, it was a partial batch failure. And the problem was they were using an older freeze dryer. Like, like TN mentioned, um, you know, freeze dryers have been around for years, and some of the older ones don't have the latest and greatest in the engineering. So what this particular dryer was older, it couldn't keep the product cold enough below its, you know, the glass transition temperature, negative 34. So some of the vials that were exceeding that temperature a little bit were, you know, going through a collapse. So what our recommendation was, you need to go to a newer freeze dryer that can keep your, you know, your product at a lower temperature. So in summary here, the DSC and free dry microscopy can and should play a major role in cycle development, not only understanding what is in our formulation, crystalline or amorphous metastable, but again in cycle development. It also, again, is a great troubleshooter, as you've seen in those client examples of understanding if something fails, the first thing we ask for is the thermal data. What's the, the glass transition temperature? Where does it collapse? So again, we can ask, what, what have we learned? Well, this allows us to take a scientific approach to freeze drying. It's not just a trial and error, put it in the freeze dryer, push the button, hope you get something good in two weeks. It tells us what it is, what are the critical temperatures. Okay, so again, this does allow us to take a scientific approach to freeze drying, which we should be doing. I mean, the, the, the FDA is asking for this. We need to be able to, to provide it to them, um, you know, when we file for a new drug application. Okay, now um, I'm going to head and turn it back over. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions. And again, all my contact information is in um, this slide here. So if there is anything outside of the webinar, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if you've got some data you want me to look at, I'm more than happy to, to take a look at and give you that on my comments as well. So with that, I believe we'll turn the floor um, over and open it up for questions. Yep, Thank, thanks, Dr. Schweigman, for your uh, presentation. Um, yeah, we'll definitely now uh, begin our Q&A portion of the webinar. So let's take a look at our first question, and uh, it is, how do you find the sweet spot for freeze drying for a particle formulation? Well, I mean, basically, it, it's kind of, re I don't say we, we develop cycles around particular products, whether it's a and when you say particle formulation, uh, we, we sort of look at the thermal properties and base it on that. So, I mean, we freeze-dried liquids, we fry, freeze-dried suspensions, I freeze-dried tissues, foods, and it all comes down to finding that critical temperature where you've either got a glass transition or a eutectic melt. So we do the same protocol, DSC freeze-dry microscopy. We find the critical temperature, and then we say we don't want to freeze-dry, you know, 20 degrees 20 degree C below that. We want to be right next to it, but we don't want to get too close to it where we run the risk of collapse or eutectic melting. So the general rule of thumb when we're developing a cycle is say, okay, we identify the critical temperature, and we're going to stay somewhere about 5 to 7 degrees C below that, that sweet spot, if you will, or that would be the sweet spot, because um, we know that product temperature rises. So identify the critical temperature, and then we start primary drying, you know, usually 5 to 7 degrees C below that. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to our next question, and this is about uh, the TG modifier. Um, do they work on H bonding, and how do you choose a suitable modifier? Well, um, yeah, I mean, some of these can. Uh, 
hydrogen bond. Um, again, a lot of these, we, we, we say the amorphous phase, um, again, is a, um, it doesn't really form, a, a, there's no crystalline bonds or lattices forming. It's essentially a, um, a viscosity shift. Um, so I'm not exactly sure of the interaction. We do know that when things form an amorphous phase, so say you have two or three different amorphous components, they will tend to form one continuous phase. So they're all crammed in there together. Um, a suitable glass transition temperature modifier is going to be something, at least in the injectable drug world, is something that's pharmaceutically acceptable for injectable drug products. Now, we know that Dextran 40 is perfect for that. Um, there's products out there where, the, where these are used uh, as glass transition temperature. Well, I shouldn't say that as glass transition temperature models, um, but they are in injectable drug products. Um, there's a couple of resources that I use. One would be the FDA has set up a searchable database, their excipient database. Log into the, go to the FDA's website, search that. The other one be um, the, the physician's desk reference. They make an electronic version that's searchable. So if I want to choose any excipient, I'll, I will search those two sites to make sure, you know, I'm within the, the amount that they're using and the route of administration. Thanks. Uh, let's move on to our next question, and it's uh, how do you eliminate vertical cracks in lyophilized product, and what are some possible causes? Well, that's interesting. I mean, cracking occurs. There's some stress that's created in in, in product when it's freeze dried, you know. And in my mind, there's some excipients, active ingredients that are just naturally going going to crack. I mean, and, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you can show that. Cracking is not an issue of, you know, you're not, uh, you know, getting too close to your critical temperature. There's not a little bit of collapse. I mean, cracking may just be um, um, more of a, uh, a cosmetic thing than anything else. Now, that's not to say it can't be fixed. I mean, what I would recommend doing is you're, you're building up some stress generally, well, during the freezing phase. What I would recommend doing is look at modifying your freezing protocol. So in this particular case, I would say let's do a, a freezing rate study and look at uh, a fast freezing protocol, a slow freezing protocol. Um, does that does that change the, the stress that's being built up during freezing? I would also look at an annealing step to see if we could minimize that, or sort of cause that stress, whatever it is, to relax so we don't get cracking in the cake, if it really bothers Thanks. you. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go on to our next question. This one is a uh, fairly long. Um, how can reducing the degree of supercooling increase ice crystal size and thus decrease the recon time? We're, we're working with a high protein concentration solution that has a higher recon time with higher concentration and do not want to change excipients. Yeah, that's 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 a tough one. I mean, you're, you're correct. Um, so how fast we freeze will affect the ice crystal size, um, meaning that it, if we freeze very quickly, you're going to get a high surface area of ice, small ice crystals, uh, much more surface area, so that, that may enhance reconstitution. Of course, it will slow down how quickly the product freeze dries. You're sort of uh, restricting the vapor flow um, versus freezing slower and getting um, – you know, a larger ice crystal surface area, which is going to dry faster, but may not reconstitute as well. My advice to, would be a couple of a couple of approaches. Um, um, I don't know if T, I don't recall if TN mentioned it, but they have they have a technology associated with a freeze dryer where they can actually control where ice will nucleate and to control the temperature where it nucleates, and that could be that could be a viable option for you. So if you're really want to investigate that, you might want to talk to them about really controlling where ice nucleates. So you could you could get nucleation you could get nucleation early to where you, you get a, a larger ice crystals or you could delay it to where you get a, a higher number of, of ice crystals if you're you're interested in reconstitution. Um, in your case, what I would probably recommend is to reduce that concentration of everything and that's easily done, well hopefully. What we've done in the past is say, okay, let's maybe dilute the sample in half and fill twice as much. So we'd go to a slightly larger vial, um, but we dilute it. And that way, you know, you minimize the effects of, you know, high concentrations of solids in your sample. 
What Jeff was referring to, this is TN, um, is a technology that where we combine controlled nucleation with uh, heat flow control. Uh, heat flow gives you the gives you uh, if you can control heat flow, you can control the ice crystal formation, and uh, that may that may or uh, be an advantage to that particular application. Thanks, okay, Dan. absolutely. Um, let's. Uh, Go on to uh, one more question here. Uh, let's see. Regarding the TG modifiers, what level of gelatin is usually effective? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, it's something you're going to have to play with. I mean, again, it, it, the 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 amount of temperature that you're able to raise is a function of the individual glass transition temperature, the, com uh, the component components you're trying to combine, and the amount. Now, in in the limit of the gelatin. Gelatin actually makes a beautiful cake. It, it you know it affects the TG prime. The problem is that when you get higher levels of gelatin, you form jello. Um, generally, I think we've worked with. I I don't remember if it's one percent or maybe ten percent. I don't recall to be honest with you, but it's whatever that point where that sample gels. You don't want it gelling, so you got to stay below that. I think it was. I think it was 1%, 10 mix per mil, I think, was what we were finding, was if we got too much over that, it started to gel, and it just it wasn't going to work. Okay. Um, I, unfortunately, um, I think that's all the time we have right now uh, for our questions. Any questions that uh, we were not able to address here live will be answered by our presenters via email. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Mr. T.N. Thompson and Dr. Chef Jeff Schwegman for sharing their knowledge with us and also offer a special thank you to Milrock Technology for sponsoring today's event. Please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to view this webinar on demand. Uh, from all of us on the webinar today, uh, please uh, I'd like to wish you a thank you and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.